The Book of the American Pit Bull Terrier Richard F. Stratton Chapter 3 The Devil's Lap Dog No one ever went broke underestimating the intelligence of the public. H. L. Mencken Recently I came across an article in which the pit bulldog was embraced by a satanic cult of some type. The reason for the honor to our breed was not its supposedly evil disposition, as I might have supposed, but rather it was because they thought the breed was proof that the pig could be interbred with another species, presumably the dog. For some reason, this proof was important to their religion. Well, I couldn't help chuckling to myself. There has been so much hogwash written about our breed. But at least this was obvious nonsense. Anyway, I thought it was. Sometimes, unfortunately, I am amazed at the apparent inexhaustible credulity of the general public. The article, though, got me to thinking about two things. First, there is the tendency on the part of the media to project an evil image of the pit bulldog and then to associate him with various and sundry unsavory elements. As just one example, a television documentary on motorcycle gangs involved an interview with a man who had been primarily concerned with investigating these groups. The investigator ticked off an impressive series of evils that were suspected of the motorcycle gangs, i.e., they were heavily into hard narcotics and were suspected of numerous robberies and the murder of a federal judge. However, he saved his most ominous tone of voice for stating that they were really heavy into pit dog fighting. Well, I don't know how many of the other charges were true, but I can assure the investigator that none of these gangs are known on the pit dog circuit. The other thought that struck me was that I had so often heard bulldogs referred to as having a pig-like appearance. This has always astounded me, as there have been few bulldogs that I thought looked in the least bit pig-like. Of course maybe I'm kennel blind, having been around bulldogs most of my life. It could be, perhaps, that our friends, the Satanists, were confused and actually had the English bull terrier in mind because even to me those dogs do look a little pig-like, with their thick bodies and down-faced snouts. But, no matter. The statement has been made by others, too, with no doubt about what breed they were discussing. A.C. Tooley, I've always felt that the American Pit Bull Terrier was a fairly average-looking dog. In other words they are pretty ordinary-looking, some might even say they look like mutts. It depends on the individual dogs, of course, as some pit bulls are so dramatic in appearance that they are real. Traffic stoppers. Others are quite homely. Again, we need to remind ourselves that the performance breeds are generally quite variable in appearance. To prove the point just compare bench show beagles with field trial beagles or show English setters with field English setters. Although there is variation in the American pit bull terriers, there are parameters within which nearly all members of the breed fit. If we average out these variations, we get a type, theoretically an ideal type. When we start thinking in terms of ideals, a breed standard usually evolves since a standard is simply a description of an ideal type. One of the most interesting standards was devised by the American Dog Breeders Association. Several experts on the breed analyzed the physical char characteristics of top winning pit dogs and from that devised a standard. It became the official standard of the American Dog Breeders Association dog shows in 1976 and reads as follows. Basis for Confirmation of APBT Experience with dogs, horses, human athletes, cattle, hogs and chickens indicates that for everything that lives and breathes there is an army of experts to tell you how that particular thing should look. 
A lot of these experts seem to lack the ability to quantitatively distinguish one physical attribute from another. Most start with an animal they love and build a standard to fit, but some few are really awesome in their knowledge of which physical dimensions work best. Those persons whose opinions on conformation have borne the test of years have, without exception, come from the ranks of the professionals who use the animals to make money. There are cattlemen who can look at 200 calves and pick the 10 best gainers by looking at their conformation. A year later those same calves bring more profit than their less well-conformed brothers. Racehorse men are the most knowledgeable conformation people you will meet. They all like the same basic things in a horse, although they claim to differ greatly, their differences are minute. As evidence, look at the bidding at a yearling sale when a full of good conformation is brought in and compare it with the prices offered for an equally well-bred full with conformation faults. Good cattlemen and good horsemen judge conformation by what the animal is supposed to do, cattlemen know from experience that they will lose money feeding narrow-shouldered, hollow-backed, long-legged calves. Horsemen know that shallow-girthed, Crooked-legged horses with straight hocks seldom cross the finish line first, and that's where the money is. Now, money doesn't give you good judgment, but it takes good judgment to hang on to it. You can bet that anyone dealing with cattle, horses, or pit bulls for a long period of time professionally has been exercising good judgment. Professionals look for an animal that can get the job done. Amateurs, because they have no way to test their theories, wind up feeding their imaginations. So let's get to the point of establishing a conformation standard for the American Pit Bull Terrier. If we are going to be forced by the laws and today's social standards into breeding a dog for looks rather than performance, in the interest of preserving the most extraordinary animal that man has ever created, Let's take a good look at what the American Pit Bull Terrier is supposed to do. His existence today was not because he was bred only for gameness. He was not bred only for power. He sure as hell was not bred only for his intelligence, loyalty, boldness, round eye, rose ear, red nose, or his inclination for dragging children from the paths of speeding trains. He was bred to win. That's right folks, he was developed for competition. The professional dogfighters have made him what he is, the professional dogfighters are improving him and when the professional dogfighters are gone, the real pit bull terrier will gradually fade away. What we will have is something the amateurs have preserved that reminds us of the gladiators of old. Thank God for the amateurs professional dogfighting is a dying occupation. Preservation of this grand athlete that was bred to go to war is inevitably going to be in the hands of the amateurs. So, let's look to the profession of the dog in establishing our standard so that our grandchildren will at least see an authentic physical reproduction of a fighting dog. If we start with the premise that conformation should reflect the ideal for the dog's usage and that this particular animal is supposed to win a dogfight, we come naturally to the question, what does it take to win? Most of those who have backed their judgment with hard-earned money would agree on the following to some degree or another. 1. Gameness. 2. Aggressiveness. 3. Stamina. 4. Wrestling Ability 5. Biting Ability Note that only one of these qualities, wrestling ability, is directly related to conformation. One other, stamina, may be partly due to conformation but is probably as much reliant on inherited efficiency of the heart and circulatory system. Some people seem to feel that the shape of the head determines hard bite, but in practice, it seems there are a lot of other factors involved. Earl Tudor said that the great Black Jack, 
who killed four opponents in seven wins in big money fights, bit hard because he wanted to bite hard. That about sums it up. Good biters seem to be where you find them regardless of the shapes of their heads. When we talk of conformation we really only mean one thing wrestling ability. This is the reason the American Pit Bull Terrier varies so much in conformation. His wrestling by itself is not nearly as important as the sum total of gameness, aggressiveness, bite and natural stamina, none of which are directly related to confirmation. Any dogfighter will tell you, if you've got a game dog with good air, he's worth a bet. I might add, if he can also bite, put a second mortgage on the house and take him to a convention. In other words, never mind what he looks like. However, wiser men than I have said, the only dead game dogs are dead ones. Also, under certain conditions most dogs will quit. I believe there's a lot of truth to that, and to reinforce the fact that conformation is important, remember that conformation and wrestling ability are very closely related and it's usually the bottom dog in the fight that quits. It's hard to stop even the rankest cur if he can stay on top. The dog whose muscle and bone structure don't permit him to wrestle on even terms needs more of everything else to win. He's always coming from behind. He frequently dies after the fight, win or lose. His career is short because each go takes so much out of him. So I believe that wrestling ability, and therefore conformation, is a very important ingredient in a fighting dog. Our standard of conformation cannot be based on what someone who never saw a dog fight thinks a fighting dog should look like, but should be based on those physical attributes displayed by winning pit dogs. American Pit Bull Terrier Conformation Look first at the overall profile of the dog. Ideally, he should be square when viewed from the side. That is, about as long from the shoulder to the point of his hip as he is tall from the top of the shoulder to the ground. Such a dog will stand high and have maximum leverage for his weight. This means that standing normally with the hock slightly back of the hip, the dog's base, where his feet are, will be slightly longer than his height. Using the hip and shoulder as guides will keep the viewer from being fooled by the way the dog is standing. Height to weight ratio is critical. Since dogs are fought at nearly identical weights, the bigger the dog you have at the weights, the better your chances. Hence, stocky dogs with long bodies, heavy shoulders and thick legs usually lose to taller, ringier opponents. Nature usually blesses a tall rangy dog with a fairly long neck which is a tremendous advantage in that it enables him to reach a stifle when his opponent may have his front leg, to take an ear to hold off a shorter necked opponent, or to reach the chest himself when the other dog is trying to hold him off. The neck should be heavily muscled right up to the base of the skull. Secondly, look at his back end. That's the drive train of any four-legged animal. A bulldog does 80% of his work off his hips and back legs. A long sloping hip is most important. By its very length, it gives leverage to the femur or thigh bone. A long hip will give the dog a slightly roached backed appearance. Hence the low set tail so often spoken of. The hip should be broad. A broad hip will carry with it a broad loin and permits a large surface for the attachment of the gluteal and the biceps femoris muscles, the biggest drivers in the power train. The femur or thigh bone should be shorter than the tibia or lower leg bone. This means that the stifle joint will be in the upper one third of the hind leg. It is not uncommon to see dogs with a low stifle. 
They are usually impressively muscled because of the bigger biceps femoris, but are surprisingly weak and slow on the back legs because of leverage lost by the long thigh. A short femur and long tibia usually mean a well-bent stifle, which in turn leads to a well-bent hock. This last is a really critical aspect of wrestling ability. When a dog finds himself being driven backward, he must rely on the natural springiness of the well-bent hock and stifle to control his movement. Dogs with straight or the frequently seen double-jointed hock of many of the Debois bred dogs will wrestle well as long as muscle power can sustain them, but if pushed, will tire in the back end more quickly and soon lose their wrestling ability. Thirdly, look at the front end. He should have a deep rib cage, well sprung at the top, but tapering to the bottom. Deep and elliptical, almost narrow is preferred to the round and barrel chested. The rib cage houses the lungs which are not storage tanks, but pumps. The ribs are like a bellows. Their efficiency is related to the difference in volume between contraction and expansion. A barrel-chested dog, in addition to carrying more weight for his height, has an air pump with a short stroke. He must take more breaths to get the same volume of air. Depth of rib cage gives more room for large lungs. Shoulders should be a little wider than the rib cage at the eighth rib. Too narrow a shoulder does not support adequate musculature but too wide a shoulder makes a dog slow and adds unnecessary weight. The scapula, shoulder blade, should be at a 45 degree or less slope to the ground and broad and flat. The humerus should be at an equal angle in the opposite direction and long enough that the elbow comes below the bottom of the rib cage. The elbows should lie flat, the humerus running almost parallel to the spine, not out at elbows which gives a wide English bulldog stance. This type of shoulder is more easily dislocated or broken. The forearm should be only slightly longer than the humerus and heavy and solid nearly twice the thickness of the metatarsal bones at the hock. The front legs and shoulders must be capable of sustaining tremendous punishment and heaviness can be an asset here. The relationship between front legs and back should be, at first appearance, of a heavy front and a delicate back. This is because in an athletic dog, the metatarsal bones, hock and lower part of the tibia will be light, fine and springy. The front legs will be heavy and solid looking. The experienced bulldog man, however, will note the wide hip, loin and powerful thigh which make the back end the most muscular. The head varies more in the present day pit bull than any other part of the body, probably because its conformation has the least to do with whether he wins or loses. However, there are certain attributes which appear to be of advantage. First its overall size. Too big a head simply carries more weight and increases the chances of having to fight a bigger dog. Too small a head is easily punished by a nose fighter and is especially easy for an ear fighter to shake. In an otherwise well-proportioned dog, the head will appear to be about two-thirds the width of the shoulders and about 25% wider at the cheeks than the neck at the base of the skull. Back of the head to the stop should be about the same distance as from the stop to the tip of the nose. The bridge of nose should be well developed which will make the area directly under the eyes considerably wider than the head at the base of the ears. Depth from the top of the head to the bottom of the jaw is important. The jaw is closed by the temporal fossa muscle exerting pressure on the coronoid process. The deeper the head at this point, that is, between the zygomatic arch and the angular process of the bottom of the jaw, the more likely the dog is to have leverage advantage both in closing the jaw and in keeping it closed. A straight, 
Box-like muzzle and well-developed mandible will not have much to do with biting power but will endure more punishment. Lip PY dogs are continually fawning themselves in a fight which works greatly to their disadvantage. Teeth should meet in the front, but more importantly, the canines or fangs should slip tightly together, the upper behind the lower when the mouth is closed. The eye elliptical when viewed from the front. In general, such a head will be wedge-shaped when viewed either from the top or side, round when viewed from the front. Skin should be thick and loose, but not in folds. It should appear to fit the dog tightly except around the neck and chest. Here the skin should be loose enough to show vertical folds even in a well-conditioned dog. The set of the tail is most important. It should be low. The length should come just above the point of the hock, thick at the base and tapering to a point at the end and should hang down like a pump handle when relaxed. The feet should be small and set high on the pasterns. The gait of the dog should be light and springy. Most of the above relates to skeletal features of the dog. When we look at muscles, from the breeder's standpoint, it is much more important to look at the genetic features of musculature than those features due to conditioning. A genetically powerful dog can be a winner in the hands of even an inept trainer, but a genetically weak dog needs a good matchmaker to win. Conditioning won't do much for him. Think of bones as levers with the joints as the fulcrum and the muscles being the power source. The power being applied to the lever is more effective the farther away from the fulcrum it is AP plied. Muscles should be long, with attachments deep down the bone, well past the joint. Short muscled dogs are impressive looking but not athletic. A muscle's power value lies in its ability to contract. The greater the difference between its relaxed state and its contracted state, the greater the power. The coat of the dog can be any color or any combination of colors. It should be short and bristled. The gloss of the coat usually reflects the health of the dog and is important to an athletic pit bulldog. Above all, the American Pit Bull Terrier is an all-around athlete. His body is called on for speed, power, agility and stamina. He must be balanced in all directions. Too much of one thing robs him of another. He is not a model formed according to human specialists. In his winning form he is a fighting machine, a thing of beauty. In judging the American Pit Bull Terrier 100 points will be possible for the ideal dog. The breakdown is as follows. Overall appearance. Attitude of dog. Head and neck. Front end of dog back end of dog tail and coat. Although this foregoing standard is the best ever devised for the American Pit Bull Terrier, in my opinion, a few comments might be in order here. First, if you were to attend a number of pit matches and attempt to select the winners by their conformation assuming that you are able to interpret. This line drawing accompanied the original American Dog Breeders Association standard and illustrates the points discussed in its text. The standard with absolute perfection, you would probably be right about 50% of the time, if you were lucky. The point is that conformation most definitely has its limitations. The thing that makes a bulldog a winner is very difficult to detect from the outside. What makes a bulldog what he is dwells in his mind and his heart. To avoid confusion, I need to comment on the statement contained in the standard that professional dogfighting is a dying occupation. Poetic license must be granted on a couple of points here, as I believe the statement was made with tongue-in-cheek. First, there is not and there never has been any such thing as a professional dog fighter. 
no one is able to make a living off the sport. In fact, just the opposite is true. If a man wants to be truly competitive in the pit dog game, he must keep a kennel of at least 25 dogs. He must raise scores of pups to get only one or two good prospects, so really it is just an expensive hobby. Second, there is no sign of the sport dying out. Again, just the opposite is true. It has gone on for as far back as we can see, it is prevalent now, and it will continue to endure. Getting back to other aspects of the standard, little is said about the ears of the dog. Should they be full drop, rose type or fully erect? Should they be cropped? I personally prefer a full drop natural ear, if it falls right. However, the standard was written, as all standards should be, with function as a frame of reference. That's why ears were barely mentioned. In pit fighting it doesn't matter if a dog has full drop, erect or rose ears or whether they are cropped or uncropped. Oh, you can get some pit dog men to argue that a natural ear affords protection and you can get some to argue that cropping the ears takes the handles off the dog. But the very fact that you have arguments on both sides, however, illustrates the point that it really makes no difference. Whether you crop your dog's ears or not will ultimately be determined by what you think looks best. The reader may not be aware of the fact that in certain countries humane-oriented groups have managed to make car cropping illegal. As a matter of fact, my own personal view is that there is a mild cruelty involved in the recuperation from ear cropping, but not enough to justify yet another oppressive law. Anyway, in arguing for a similar law here the opponents of ear cropping often utilize the tactic of stating that ear cropping originated with dog fighting. Obviously this is supposed to evoke proper abhorrence. Unfortunately it just isn't true. As in so many cases, our critics should be asked to produce proof to document their wild stories. Chapter 4 Rogues Gallery. These were honored in their generations and were the glory of their times. Ecclesiastes XLIV, 7. As I have said many times, the vast majority of American pit bull terrier owners never fight their dogs. Nearly everyone, however, wants them from good game stock. And why not? Gameness is the very essence of the breed and it doesn't hurt your pride any to know that your dog was descended from great ancestors. Moreover, the more people that select and breed such dogs, the more likely we will be to maintain or even improve the quality of the breed. With this in mind I would like to tell the stories of some of the relatively modern dogs. As in the last book, Worthy dogs will be left out and for this I apologize. Unfortunately, space is limited and some of the most reputable dog men operate in absolute secrecy, never reporting any of their dogs' matches and never offering dogs for sale or at stud. The result is that these people never get hassled in the least degree, but a concomitant result is that their dogs never become famous. The dogs, however, don't care and the owners are apparently content with just a few people knowing of their quality. There are a variety of things that determine whether a dog will be an important one in the pedigree of future generations of good dogs. Some of these factors are discussed in the following article. Free Blockbusters Richard F. Stratton this article appeared in Pitbull Gazette, November 1979. In a small pit dog convention in a small Mississippi town several years ago, three dogs were matched that were to become legendary in modern pit dog history. They were going light Barney, Bolio, and Boomerang. The three dogs were very close to the same pit weight, but they were never matched against each other. 
Barney and Boomerang both blew right through their dogs, winning with little difficulty. Bolio, on the other hand, had a rougher time of it, having to come up from the bottom to win. Bolio, thus, won the coveted Best in Show award. Boomerang went on to win five times in his career, three times winning a Best in Show award. Barney never won any such awards, but he compiled a higher win record than the other two dogs put together. Bolio, having proven his gameness, was retired after his first match. Unfortunately, Barney also suffered an ignominious defeat at a later match in Dallas. After being top dog for 16 minutes, he was counted out in his Suarna. The turn was called on the other dog. This loss has made Barney very controversial, in fact, probably the most controversial dog in recent pit dog history. There were other matches, you see, in which Barney had shown ample gameness. Twice he came up from the bottom to win. Twice he went over the hour mark. Once he came close to the two hour mark. But there was still that quid in Dallas to produce a nagging doubt about Barney. His owner swore up and down that Barney was doped in that match. Others thought it was the unbearable heat that beat Barney. Still, a good dog is not supposed to quit regardless of CR. An alternative measure of a dog's worth is what he produces as a stud dog. Unfortunately, Barney has never been open to public stud, so little is known about what he has produced. The greatest known producer of our three blockbust heirs has been Bolio. We should keep in mind, however, that becoming a good producer is partly dependent on the number of times a dog has been bred. And I suspect that Bolio was bred more times than either Barney or Boomerang. Be that as it may, Bolio must already be credited as a great producer. Boomerang has been no slouch in that department either, as two of the greatest dogs in the country were sired by him. When I say Bolio was probably bred more than the other two dogs, I am speaking hypothetically, as many breedings are kept secret and I am at opposite ends of the country from Boomerang. However, Pit dog men have a penchant for breeding to the very gamest dog they can find. Deep gameness is the most essential quality in a pit dog and it is the most elusive trait to attain. For that reason, experienced breeders utilize the gamest dog to which they have access, with ability being only a secondary consideration. To some it may seem that breeding chiefly for gameness is a process that inevitably will lead to the deterioration of ability for the sake of gameness. That does not seem to be the case, for many famous producers of bone-crushing pit artists had little aboli tie themselves. Thus, Wallace's Tony produced the immortal King Cotton, Bouncer produced Dibois, and Bolio produced the fabulous Chen Lang. When a stud dog is evaluated for possible use, three main criteria are analyzed, the dog's breeding, the dog's own performance and what he has produced. Of course, if a dog has not been bred before, he can't be evaluated as a producer. However, if a dog is proven game and is from proven game parents and grandparents, his chances of being a producer are truly great. There will continue to be arguments about the worth of these three dogs. In the final analysis, however, it is what the dogs produce at stud that determines whether they achieve lasting veneration. Bolio and Boomerang are already on their way toward immortality. Barney has only recently been bred and it will be interesting to see in the years ahead which of our three blockbusters is the most prized name in a pedigree. What bold ruler was to horse racing, Dibois and Rascal were to the pit dog game. The following article told the story of Dibois. Those super duper Dibio dogs.
Richard F. Stratton. Bloodlines Journal, September-October 1976. Thunder and Lightning, Fire and Steel. Super Strong and Robust. That is the image of the Deborascal dogs, and while certainly not all the members of that line correspond to the image, it must be acknowledged that a number of them do, and the so-called Debois line has been exceedingly popular for many years now. And those who study the pedigrees of their dogs take increasing delight at each appearance of the name Debois, pronounced Dibio. For those who are interested in the history of the American Pit Bull Terrier breed, it should be mentioned that there are those who resist the idea of naming an entire strain of dogs after an individual dog, and who feel that the Debois strain should be referred to as the Feely line, while keeping in mind that, like nearly all the old-time lines, it is no longer a pure strain. Another name utilized at one time for the Debois strain was, the Arizona Dogs, as most of the original dogs were whelped in the Phoenix area. It should also be mentioned that there are also those who feel that the dawn of the Debois era marked more a change in the efforts of the breeders of pit dogs than it did in the dogs themselves. Previously, the old-time breeders had always striven for gameness above all else and were content to allow ability to turn up of its own accord, but many of the post debois breeders began to concentrate on ability and to merely hope that the dogs would inherit enough gameness to car them. While the eventual results were the same, there had been a very definite change in emphasis. In fact, Old-timers were wont to speak disparagingly of such breeders as the modern Pepsi generation. Those who call the strain the Feely line do so to honor Con Feely who was one of the few breeders praised in George R. Midich's famous book 30 Years with Fighting Dogs. Feely had put together a family of dogs based on dogs he had imported from Ireland who were of the famed old family bloodlines. He owned a large saloon around the turn of the century, and rooms above the saloon were let out to rent. One of the tenants of one of those rooms was Jack Williams who, after Con Feely's death, dedicated the latter portion of his life to perpetuating the Feely bloodlines. A man named Bruce that had worked for Feely and another one named Slattery also had a major hand in perpetuating the old Feely line. So it was that the Feely strain was still intact even after the Korean War. And the stage was set for the coming of Debois. While most great dogs were the result of years of careful planning by dedicated breeders, Debois was the result of a breeding made by an amateur named Smith. It just so happened that the dogs that he had in hand were absolutely top bred, and they were of nearly pure Feely bloodlines. Smith sold Debois as a pup to a man named Jensen who only wanted a pup as a pet for his young son. The young boy named his new pup Dumbo, of all things, but later he tired of him and urged his father to get him a collie. This was back in the days of the Lassie movies and of the debut of the Lassie TV series. Jensen contacted the great breeder Howard Hainzel and offered to trade his Dumbo, Debois, for a collie. Now Hainzel had mixed feelings about acquiring this dog. He knew that both Bounce, Debois' father, and Bambi, Debois' mother, were good dogs, but he had reason to doubt the quality of one of Bounce's sisters. But Hainzel decided to take a chance, and got a collie out of the city dog pound for five or ten dollars, and traded dogs with Jensen, who undoubtedly went home thinking he had pulled off a great deal for himself. Even though Dumbo, Debois, was two years old, he was a dedicated pacifist and ran loose at Hainzel's place, always staying out of reach of the chained dogs, although he was occasionally bullied by Mrs. Hainzel's Boston Terrier. He followed Hainzel around as he fed the dogs and did the other chores. When Earl Tudor, one of the most famous of the old pit dog men, 
visited Heinze, he took quite a shine to Dibois, and Heinze offered him any dog on the place practically, trying to get him to take a good dog. However, Tudor had faith in Dibois, he apparently got the name Dibois after Tudor got him, and took him home with him. Well, the rest is history. Dibois went on to become a great pit dog, but his real contribution was his prepotency as a stud dog. He sired the fabulous White Rock, along with Tudor Spike, Tudor's Jeff, and many other game dogs that were especially noted for outstanding ability. The story of Dibois, besides being of interest to the modern pit bull and Staffordshire Terrier fancier for its historical value, is also instructive. Many modern fanciers, of staffs and pit bulls, confuse aggressiveness with gameness. Some of the greatest and gamest dogs have been easygoing animals like Dibois, whose name ironically has become a synonym for the fire-breathing type of pit bull. Most people are very interested in the Wallace dogs, as well they should be, as they reflect a lifetime of breeding selections by one of the most honest breeders of all time. Unfortunately, only remnants of the strain are left. The following article helps explain the reason for this state of affairs. Additional information on the Wallace Bloodlines Richard F. Stratton Bloodlines Journal, May-June 1976 some time ago, in fact over two years ago, I promised to give more information on the Wallace strain of the American, Pitt, Bull Terriers. I had hoped to cover some of the other strains before getting back with this one, however, in view of the fact that I have been besieged by requests for information on the line, and meantime, I became bogged down with discussions of other matters in the magazine, I'll complete my dissertation on the Wallace strain now and get on to others at a later time. The Wallace bloodline was originally based mainly on three dogs, Centipede, Circe Jeff, and Wallace's Tony. Centipede was a pure old family red nose, owned by Dave Ferguson, who was destined to die a hero's death in World War II. Before his death, Ferguson was a trumpet player in a big-name band, and had to travel a great deal. He would therefore leave Centipede with various trusted friends to care for him while he was on the road. Whoever kept the dog was allowed breeding rights, and, consequently, most of today's red-nosed stock has Centipede somewhere in its ancestry. Wallace bred Penny, a shipley bitch, to Centipede and got a litter of outstanding pups, Stinger, Scorpion, Spider, etc., that came to be known as the Outlaws. Spider was bred to Circe Jeff to produce a number of good pups, one of which was Madam Queen. Madam Queen was bred to Tony to produce King Cotton, who was discussed in the last article on Wallace. It should be noted at this point that, Although the Wallace line was part red nose in terms of ancestry, the dogs themselves were mainly small brindle, white, or brindle and white dogs. It was this era of dogs of which Wallace was most proud. It was only later that Wallace began keeping dogs of the old family red nose to utilize as an outcross for his own bloodline. The latter-day Wallace line became an amalgamation of his old strain crossed in various ways with the old family red nose. They were larger dogs that were usually red in color and frequently showed the red nose. During all these years, from the King Cotton era on, I have been close friends with the Wallaces. In those early days, however, I was not interested in breeding a particular strain, rather, I just appreciated a good dog. Consequently, many a good Wallace dog passed through my hands without ever being bred. Ironically, when I became interested in perpetuating the Wallace line, it was nearly gone. Wallace was old and infirm, and was not breeding dogs any longer, 
and those who had gotten dogs from him had polluted the line by crossing it to other strains. However, I received one male at this time, a solid red, copper-nosed dog called Wallace's Bad Red. The only other pure Wallace dog was Bob's own house dog, Patches. By a strange stroke of fate, Red and years later. Patches, a very old dog, died of a heart attack, and Red perished in a tragic kennel fight with one of his own sons. Thus, in the wink of an eye, the last of the pure old Wallace dogs passed from this earth. In the meantime, however, I had obtained, by courtesy of Bert Sorrels, a daughter of Wallace's talking boy. Talking Boy was also known as Sorel's Hard Rock, and was the sire of the now famous Dugan. This little female, Sorel's Cat Baloo or Riptide Rhoda, was bred twice to Riptide, Wallace's, Bad Red, and from these litters came Riptide Cyclone, Honey Bear, Riptide Talking Girl, and other quality dogs. Riptide there were two or three other people in my area who became infected with pit bull fever and became interested in perpetuating the Wallace line. Since these gentlemen were marine biologists and oceanographers, and I, too, have been interested and involved somewhat in the studies of the sea, we hit upon the name Riptide, an overpowering ocean current, to apply to the Wallace dogs we were trying to perpetuate. The combine that we formed may seem an unlikely combination of pit bull breeders, but it has proved at this date to be a felicitious one, and we all agreed not to sell any dogs until we had some measure of quality of our brood stock. A number of people have asked to buy dogs from me, and I have had to disappoint them. This summer we may disperse some of the pups for the first time, but only to people who are interested in perpetuating the Wallace line. If we decide to release some pups, an advertisement will appear in Bloodlines later on this summer. Another breeding made with Bad Red was to go in Light CNDY, who was down from the Red Lady segment of the old Jim Williams Red Nosed line, and we thus have a line of old family Red Nosed dogs to go with our old family, Black Nosed, Wallace dogs. It should be emphasized, however, that none of these dogs are strictly speaking pure Wallace dogs, but they are the closest thing to it alive today. Finally, I would like to reiterate that it is not my intention to claim the Wallace line as the greatest ever. All strains produce good and bad dogs. The quality lines are only more consistent about producing good dogs. The main advantage the Wallace bloodline has to offer, in my opinion, is that, first of all, it is a relatively pure strain, and this in itself is a thing of value. Second, the line was originated and perpetuated by a man who was something of a genius at breeding pit bulls. And further, he was a scrupulously honest breeder who set the breeding down right and kept it straight. In this era of breeders who deliberately scramble pedigrees, that alone is worth a lot. The following are individual dogs that either are already well established as important dogs in pedigrees or they very likely will be important in the years to come. Alvin, pit weight, 34 pounds. One of the greatest dogs of recent times was a little spotted dog with the innocuous name of Alvin. Alvin was only matched twice, but he went against bigger dogs both times and demonstrated outstanding ability and gameness, especially in the second match which went in excess of two hours. Since he was a scatterbred dog, conventional wisdom held that he would not be a producer of good dogs. Alvin, however, fooled everybody by producing many outstanding pit dogs, even when bred to a variety of bitches. The second and third generation Alvin dogs have also demonstrated quality. Earl Tudor called Alvin the greatest dog he had seen in 40 years. 
It is also interesting to note that while others were trying to get Tudor dogs, Earl Tudor was trying to get Alvin dogs. Peterbilt, pit weight, 41 pounds. Peterbilt is the son of O'Brien. O'Brien himself was a great dog, coming up from the bottom to win in a match in which he demonstrated outstanding gameness and durability. Like Debois, O'Brien's own performance has been overshadowed by those of his progeny. Dogs such as Peterbilt and Solomon are proving that O'Brien was a prepotent stud dog. At this date Peterbilt has won for matches, on one occasion going over two hours against a bad bulldog. His most spectacular win was the time he was matched 16 pounds uphill. For 10 minutes the big 62-pound dog shook his smaller opponent like a rag, but Pete started coming up at the 12-minute mark and killed that big dog right in the pit in 37 minutes. Apparently the owner of the big dog couldn't believe what was happening and didn't pick up his dog to save him. What made the win even more impressive was that the 62-pounder had won twice at that weight in previous matches. Jesse, pit weight, 49 pounds. Jesse came from a litter that produced great dogs such as Hank, a five-time winner, and Smith, a very game loser. While Jesse was not blessed with great ability, he compensated for that with great gameness and outstanding pit intelligence. He was a three-time winner and those who see his name in their dog's pedigree can be justifiably proud. Jesse was sired by Kephart's tip and was out of Kephart's Susie. Blind Billy Every man during the course of his lifetime has one particular dog to whom he is especially close. In Bob Wallace's words, Blind Billy was kin to Floyd Boudreaux. Howard Hainzel produced Blind Billy by breeding a daughter of Arizona Pete, Debois' brother, to Debois. Although he was blind, Bill was matched and gave an excellent accounting of himself. On his scratches he located the other dog by utilizing his sense of smell. He lost one match because his nose had been chewed on and he was counted out while searching the pit for his opponent, he could not find him because his nose was clogged up. After that Bill was retired to stud and he is in the pedigree of many of the great modern dogs. Jimmy Boots, Pit Weight, Catch Weight Jimmy Boots is generally considered one of the greatest of modern dogs. He was sired by Kennedy's Booger Red and was out of Uselton's flow. To see this dog's greatness in true perspective, the reader needs to know that one of the most honored dogs of recent times was Bully Sun. The only match Bully Sun ever lost was to Benny Bob, his own son. Benny Bob, in turn, was beaten by Jimmy Boots in two hours and four minutes. Boots won over other rough dogs in matches ranging from 17 to 48 minutes. Hank, pit weight, catch weight. Hank was mentioned earlier as a brother to Jesse and Smith. A five-time winner, Hank is an impressive-looking dog and has already established himself as a sire of note. It was sometimes said that Hank did not outfight his opponents but simply dazzled them with crazy moves. A turn was nearly always called on Hank within the first two minutes and his scratches were a sight to behold. He would scratch in a zigzag style as though trying to avoid enemy torpedoes. Another time he would scratch to a neutral corner and then charge full bore on a bewildered opponent, and handler, from the side. Actually, all these moves were simply idiosyncrasies, or showboating, on the part of the dog. Hank won because he was the toughest, smartest and most durable dog in the contest. Gator, pit weight, 41 pounds. Gator is the son of Boomerang. 
Boomerang is by Carver's pistol out of Carver's Miss Spike a daughter of Tudor's Spike. Gator is the product of Boomerang being bred back to his daughter, Miss Boomer, who was a granddaughter of Bully Son. Gator won three matches before he was two years old. Most dogs would not even be rolled until they were two years old. The last match was won over a particularly great dog and Gator had to demonstrate outstanding gameness as well as ability in order to win. He is the type of dog that is bound to be a producer. Hainzel's Tinker, Pit Weight, 48 pounds. Tinker was a devastating dog and won for matches in the hands of several different owners. His last match was won with ease and was all the more remarkable because his teeth were worn down and he was nine years old. Art, Pit Weight, 39 pounds. Art sailed through five opponents with incredible ease. Afterwards he was retired at stud, by a new owner, and was advertised as, Art, the dog with a heart. Despite being open to public stud the dog was stolen and although a $3,000 and no questions asked reward was offered, he has at this date never been returned. It should be mentioned that the horse thief of olden days was popular in comparison to how pit dog men feel about dog thieves. The quickest way to get put out of the dog game is to get caught stealing a dog, but sadly, certain misfits will still take the chance if a particularly good dog turns up. It is unfortunate indeed that Art lost his luxurious home and finished out his days with some low-down dog thief who was unfit to even carry water to such a fine animal. Art was one of Eli, Jr.'s illustrious sons. Tudor's Spike, Pit Weight, 43 pounds. Spike was one of the dogs that made Debois such a famous sire. He was a rough and hard-driving dog that could actually break shoulders and have a dog helpless in short order. It is interesting to note that most of the dogs mentioned in this chapter have tutors Spike somewhere in their pedigree. Hope, Pit Weight, 39 pounds. I suddenly realized that I might be in trouble writing this book. All the dogs I have mentioned in this chapter were males. Now that would get the feminists down on me very quickly. The truth is that there have been many great females too, and Hope is among the finest. She is a five-time winner and has been retired for breeding. Like her illustrious daughter, Hope's mother, Catfish, was a female with a winning record too. Catfish was bred to Tombstone, another winner, to produce Hope. At this date Hope is being bred to Hank and it will be interesting to see the quality of the progeny. Having given a sampling of the modern pit greats, let us now turn our attention to an often asked question. Are the modern dogs as good as the old-time dogs? My answer would be that they are better. In the old days it was easier for a particular dog to dominate because he was only drawing opponents from a relatively small area. In this era of rapid transportation a dog must face world-class competition to prove himself an ace, for dogs will be brought clear across the country for the express purpose of beating him. Thus, there are few old-time dogs, indeed, for which I would trade a gator or a Peterbilt.